Right, well, uh, we might get started. And firstly, I'd like to welcome all of you to the University of Queensland's Global Leadership Series for 2013. This is a series that UQ established to bring a lively program of events to our alumni and community on matters that impact on the world around us. And obviously, we're delighted to see such a good roll up this evening. So tonight, we've got a very good program ahead. We've got a star-studded panel addressing the topic improving the reach of vaccines to the developing world with nanopatches. So it looks like it will be an extremely interesting evening. Now, my name is Peter Gray. I'm director of AIBN, the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology. And we're delighted to be hosting this evening's events. I would like to welcome some special guests to this evening's event. The Honourable Justice Rosalind Atkinson, judge in the Supreme Court of Australia, we have Queensland's Chief Scientist Jeff Garrett AO, who will be taking part in the panel discussions. And our guests on the panel, Professor Ian Fraser AC and Professor Robert Boy, who I'll introduce to you shortly. We have apologies from UQ's Vice-Chancellor, Professor Peter Hoy, who would have liked to have been here tonight, but there's a Senate meeting. And I just heard there are 80 student protesters with megaphones outside the Senate building protesting the meeting, so I feel very sure that he would have preferred to have been here this evening rather than facing that. And then we have Professor Nick Fisk, Executive Dean of UQ's Faculty of Health Sciences, and many other people I'm sure in the audience that I haven't acknowledged, but welcome to all of you. So it is particularly pleasing to see such a large engaged group at tonight's event. Hopefully most of you have heard of AIBN, some of you might only know us as the Institute with the impossibly long name. But AIBN was established by UQ as the second of the new research institutes at the university, following the very successful Institute for Molecular Biosciences, IMB. So AIBN was established to bring together two transformative fields, nanotechnology and bioengineering biotechnology. And these two technologies are slated to have major impact in the 21st century. Now, the vision displayed by UQ in establishing AIBN has been amply rewarded. We've now grown to an institute of 450 people and an annual turnover of $40 million, 86% of which is raised competitively from national and international sources. The work that you'll hear about tonight, Nanopatch, is an excellent example of the power and opportunities for research at the BioNano interface. Now, we're very pleased that AIBN was established with support from Mr. Chuck Feeney of the Atlantic Philanthropies, the Queensland Government, and the University of Queensland. And their funding allowed us to design and construct a specialised $80 million building completed in 2006, when the Institute moved into the building. And this has all the facilities needed for bio-nano research. Uh, we had support from the federal government, Queensland state government, and have a series of national research infrastructures. You might have heard of one that we actually made the monoclonal antibody against the Hendra virus for the Queensland government as an emergency drug. And that's something that we could do having the facilities are unique to Australia. So tonight we're showcasing the nanopatch, which is one of the examples of the exciting research underway in AIBN. And time really doesn't permit me to summarise other research activities, but I'll mention one fact. Australia has a national special research initiative in the field of stem cells. And this research is being led by a number of chief investigators around the country. And in AIBN, we have the largest number nationally of chief investigators researching the potential for stem cells, both induced pluripotent cells, IPS and embryonic, to revolutionise medical therapy and research. And perhaps that's another fascinating topic for the GLS series, Trina and Prue. OK, well, the order of proceedings tonight is I'll briefly introduce our panel, give them the right of reply. Uh, we'll then show a short video and have a few comments on the nanopatch from Mark Kendall, the inventor of the, the nanopatch followed by structured discussions of the panel, which Jeff Garrett has kindly agreed to facilitate. And he's rapidly writing down a few questions there as we speak. 
I would like to inform you that tonight's proceedings are being recorded and an edited version of the proceedings will be made available as a podcast. Now, in our panel, we've got three eminent people, scientists, medico and an engineer, all who bring different respective insights into this whole fascinating area of vaccination. Professor Ian Fraser is known internationally for his outstanding achievement in developing a vaccine effective in preventing human papillomavirus, HPV infection, and hence cervical cancer, the second most common cancer in women globally. The commercial products, the one that's best known of which is Gardasil, has been given to over 80 million people globally. Fantastic achievement. So this has really been a, a tour de force of a basic research to discover that the, the, the antigen was effective, developing a new vaccine, taking it from Australia to commercially develop to a major global product. Now the success of Gardasil has led to international notoriety for Ian on another front. Back in March 2006, the weekend Australian magazine had a photo on the cover with Ian saying, God's gift to women. <laughs> now the subtext is a little bit qualifying. It says, uh, why Australian of the Year, Professor Ian Fraser, a loving husband and father of three, has female admirers around the globe. And it's a pretty good story. And that has stuck with Ian. If you do a bit of a Google search, you'll find this popping up everywhere. Combine God with Ian Fraser and there you get it. <laughs> so that's a fantastic success. But I think the rest of us who know Ian and know that he's a really dedicated and passionate scientist and medical researcher who's always given freely of his time to promote the advantages of good quality research and to many groups. And when he was Australian of the Year, you could ask him later, but he gave hundreds of talk to every group about the importance of science. And I think we're very grateful to him for this wonderful contribution. Now in the notes, you'll see there are many awards and CVs, uh, prizes listed in his CV. I'll just mention one. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of London, and he's a fellow of the, both Australian academies, the Academy of Science and the Academy of Engineering. And that's a wonderful achievement. Our second panellist, Professor Robert Boy, has travelled up from Sydney to join the panel. And Robert, we appreciate you coming to contribute tonight. Robert is Head of Clinical Research at the National Centre for Immunisation, Research and Surveillance, and a professor at the University of Sydney. He's a UQ alumnus with an honours degree in medicine and trained in paediatrics at the Royal Children's Hospital in Brisbane. He has previously worked extensively in Oxford and London on research on life-threatening infectious diseases. He is active in studying clinical, public health, social and economic burden of infectious diseases and is particularly engaged in producing public awareness literature and videos in the field of immunisation. So welcome, Robert, to the proceedings. Mark Kendall, the inventor of the nanopatch, is one of the 20 research group leaders in AIBN. Mark also is a UQ alumnus, BE and PhD in engineering went overseas and came back to UQ from Oxford, where he'd been working on another alternate delivery system. Now Mark's appointment is a joint appointment between AIBN, the Diamantina Institute that Ian Fraser was running at the time, and the Faculty of Health Sciences, and we're delighted that the, the current Dean, Nick Fisk, is with us. And that's something that at UQ we like to do, of making sure people have affiliations across a range of places to help uh, with working at these key interfaces. Now the research you'll hear about tonight's all been carried out in the AIBN building and the facilities I briefly alluded to earlier meant that in the one building Mark's been able to produce the nano patches, evaluate them, carry out animal testing on the facilities we have in the custom design area. Now once Mark moved back to Australia, he has single-mindedly pursued his vision to develop the nano patch and you'll hear more about that tonight. So just to sort of start the evening off and to give you a little bit of feeling and flavour of our panellists, I'm going to give each of them a, a short time to just say a little bit about where they sit in this whole field and I'll start off with Robert Boy, given that you've travelled the furthest, to talk to us about some of his feeling on the subject. Uh, well I'll be brief, uh, I'm a paediatrician, a children's doctor, I trained uh, right here in Brisbane at the U University of Queensland and um, I, like Mark, went to Oxford to do my doctoral studies and, and mine were on uh, a public health 
question of improving the safe, of proving, not improving, but proving the safety and effectiveness of a new vaccine against the most common cause of bacterial meningitis, a killer, uh, in children, uh, using a new uh, technology at the time called a conjugate vaccine. Now, immunisation is the safest and the most effective way of preventing serious, nasty infections, not only in children, but also in adults. And it literally saves millions of lives every year. Um, this is an elegant, simple public health intervention, and it's second only to clean water as a lifesaver. Um, my own research has been driven by the, the cases I see in hospital uh, of children uh, on, on death's door uh, with killer diseases, not only meningitis, but also encephalitis, blood poisoning, septicemia, pneumonia. And seeing that in their patients, in my patients, and seeing the impact on their families drives me, not only as a clinician, but as a public health researcher, to get better vaccines. Um, <clears throat> so it actually takes at least 15 years to develop a new vaccine. And then that vaccine tends to be introduced in a rich country like Australia, where the burden of disease is moderate. Tragically, it generally takes another 15 years, as it did with the, the, own, the vaccine I researched in the early 90s. Uh, 15 years later, Papua New Guinea got that vaccine in about 2008, 2009. So what we're here about tonight is to work on ways to narrow that gap, to bring life-saving vaccines that prevent not only death but disability to the people who need it, uh, in the uh, Asia Pacific, uh, in Africa, and narrow the gap. And nanopatch, I think, is a superb way to address that question. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Ian. Well, Peter pointed out that I might have been called God's gift to woman, or at least uh, I think it was the vaccine they were really talking about. I should point out that a similar story was put into Cosmopolitan magazine with a picture of me, and the headline there was a little different, the little prick that may save your life. Uh, 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 so uh, there's uh, fame and then there's another sort of knowledge. Uh, look, I'm interested in vaccines for the future. We have a great range of vaccines at the moment which protect us against a lot of serious diseases that we really have almost forgotten about because they are so much in the past now. We still have major challenges that we face, malaria, HIV, and all the viruses that cause cancer that we don't yet have vaccines for. So we would like to get these new vaccines, but we recognize that the straightforward and relatively simple approach to developing vaccines that we've used over the last uh, 200 years has probably reached fairly close to what it can deliver. We need new technologies. We need technologies which produce different sorts of immune responses. We need technologies which target things in a different way from the way we've done in the past. Put simply, growing up a virus and killing it or making it so that it can't cause disease but protect you is no longer sufficient to deliver the vaccines we need in the future. We need these new technologies for a number of reasons. Partly because that's what you as the general public want. If I asked you what the vaccines that you would like to have would look like, you would tell me you just want one shot. You wouldn't want it as a shot at all. You'd want it to be given to you as a tablet, preferably. And that would protect you against all of the diseases you need to be protected against. So it's nice and simple. Now, free, perfect, no trouble. But if you ask governments what they need, they need all of the above to make the vaccines acceptable. But they also want them to be cheap. They want them to have no need to be kept cold because delivering vaccines in the developing world particularly is a matter of having vaccines that don't need to be kept cold because they simply aren't kept cold and if they don't work then they're not worth giving. And ideally they should be small in packaging. Now that sounds trivial but the reality is that if you've got to vaccinate a whole country then the mountain of vaccine that you need to do that is huge and it's got to be stored somewhere, it's got to be carried around, it's got to be delivered. So we need new technologies not only to solve the problems of the diseases we can't solve at the moment but also to better manage the vaccine programs that we give out right now. And that's where the technologies like Mark's Nanopatch are going hopefully to so help solve the problems. So that's what I see as the vision for the future and I think that we have, as they say, the technology. Thank you, Ian.
Mark, so a few words. Uh, yes, sir. my name is uh, Professor Mark Kendall. I'm a mechanical engineer uh, by training. Uh, life's full of surprises. Uh, I gave a presentation about 15 years ago and a, a guy came up to me and talked about an idea he had about firing vaccines into the skin. And I, I thought that sounded like fun. Um, before I knew it, I was, I was in Oxford working on a device like this. It's, it's called a gene gun. And um, I've been in the field since. So for the last 15 years, I've been working on vaccine delivery technologies. It's been punctuated by two devices. Uh, the first is the gene gun, uh, when I was at Oxford, and more recently here at the, the University of Queensland with the, the nanopatch technology. Uh, so you'll hear more about that uh, with uh, uh, the video that's about to start and um, uh, a presentation I'll give. Thank you. Right, well, we are going to have a short video, and I should just give you a bit of background that uh, Mark last year won a Rolex award. It's a very competitive award, it runs every two years, thousands apply, and Mark's only the second Australian who has won it. And as part of that, a video was made that I'm now going to play that puts a bit of perspective on the work. The needle's been around a long time and on many levels it is successful, but it could be argued that we're missing our immune sweet spot, which is the skin. I was at a, a conference and I was uh, in a presentation and bored and, and started doodling. My engineer's instinct told me that this was something important. It was a really interesting half an hour where the template for the nano patch was laid down. This is a one example of a nano patch. So to the naked eye, it just looks like a, a square. But if we looked under a microscope, what you'd see is thousands of tiny projections that we dry coat vaccine to. And the idea is that we take this patch and we apply it to the skin. And in doing that, we breach the tough outer layer and deliver vaccine directly to that immune cell population just below the surface. The Rolex project allows us for the very first time to apply the nanopatch to the developing world. That's very important because most of the deaths due to infectious disease take place there. If we take a look at the numbers, there's 17 million deaths per year due to infectious disease. The test case of vaccine that we're using, which is human papillomavirus, it's a, a virus that can lead to cervical cancer. And Papua New Guinea has the worst incidents in the world. And what's holding it back is the, the cost of that vaccine. We have people concentrating on improving the vaccine itself, but there's been a lack of attention on the delivery side of it. These devices are configured for very low cost and uh, a high rollout, and uh, they're reusable. A, a key thing about the nanopatch is because it's in dry form, it doesn't need refrigeration, and that will remove the need for the cold chain, and that's perfect for, for Papua New Guinea. It's such a mountainous terrain, it's very difficult to get from one province to the next. There's about 800 fridges in this country for maintaining the cold chain and they're breaking down and, and they only have a certain reach anyway, they're not in remote villages. So immediately those regions are, are literally, in vaccine terms, in the dark. So many children here with pneumonia, meningitis caused by bacteria that could be prevented. If Mark's nanopatch can sort out the cold chain in one fell swoop, it'll make a huge difference. I'm an engineer, so I don't see these settings very often, even in the developed world. Uh, so uh, I'm finding it confronting, uh, but also uh, really inspirational. I'm, I'm inspired by how, how beautiful these, these people are, uh, but I'm also, it's, it's a kick up the backside to really get this nano patch out. Uh, so that's, that's really what we want to do. Jump on the plane, get back to the lab and move it along. Vaccines, uh, very expensive to make. With the nano patch, we only need a, a fraction of that dose. Usually they need to roll it out to the developed world markets to uh, recoup some of their costs. The, the Rolex Award for Enterprise is important. It allows us to get the nano patch technology out into the developing world.
Immediately, it's serving as a, as a spark to fast track that activity that can lead into something much bigger. Okay, we might just get Mark to give a couple of slides on the, the technology behind the patch. And you're going to do it from there, Mark? So while Mark's coming over, what, what I might do then is introduce Jeff Garrett, who's then going to facilitate your Q&A. Jeff is Queensland's chief scientist. He was previously head of CSIRO and the South African equivalent. And also he's the author of a very successful book, Herding Cats, which is about uh, organising and running highly productive research activities and the people that, that house them. So Jeff, we're delighted you could come along and join in. And after the slides, if you can take over. Right. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Uh, being an academic, we're always tempted to uh, present a lot of data. So you can relax. So I won't be doing that today. Uh, but I thought I'd step you through a few knowns and unknowns. Uh, so we take a look at this drawing. We know what it is. It, it's a needle. But we might not know, uh, well, some of us in the room at least might not know how old it is. We know it's pretty old. And I'm prepared to take two bids uh, from the audience uh, for guessing uh, how old uh, the needle is. When was it first invented? For those of you who know the answer who've seen me present before, please step aside. So two, two bids. When was the needle first invented? What? 1870s, and there was another bit over here. Ancient Rome. Possible. I don't have any data on that one, I'm afraid. Uh, but the 1870s isn't too far off. Uh, so a Scotsman came up with this uh, in 1853. This is a, from a patent, and it's an engineering drawing. And I like it because I'm an engineer. Uh, so we know the needle's been around for a while. You might not have known it was invented in 1853. You're probably aware that uh, most vaccines are delivered uh, with a needle and syringe. And there's another thing that we know about it. Most of us just don't like the needle, okay? But you might not know the impact that has on, on vaccines and improving uh, human health. Uh, you might not know that 20% uh, of the population, it's been estimated, have a thing called needle phobia, and that actually has an impact on uh, pe preventing uh, people from going to get vaccinated. So that's a real, uh, a real fear. And there's also other problems, needle stick injuries. Uh, you, you, you know about them, you've heard about them, but you not, might not realise in the developing world that's a big concern. Uh, the WHO estimates that about a third of vaccinations that take place in Africa are thought to be unsafe due to cross-contamination and needle stick injuries. So there, there are a bunch of important concerns. But uh, there's, there's two others that you, you may not be aware of. Uh, so the first, which was touched upon in the movie, is uh, uh, that vaccines in liquid form uh, need to be refrigerated and maintaining the refrigeration through storage and transportation is called the cold chain and maintaining those links in the developing world is particularly difficult. Now in Papua New Guinea, uh, Robert and I were there and we, we, we gained insights into that firsthand and this is an extreme uh, picture to grab your attention. It's a fridge that's used for vaccination, uh, or vaccine storage and you might not see the solar panels uh, at the top uh, to, to keep, keep the vaccines cool. It's a very difficult tolerance to meet, uh, the two to four degrees Celsius. But beyond that, uh, the, the last point I'd like to give you about the, the shortcomings of the needle in the context of vaccines is it, it prevents, well, it could be holding back uh, the next generation vaccines or indeed uh, uh, contributing to vaccines being expensive because it's putting vaccine into muscle that doesn't have the same concentration of immune cells that the skin has. Now, it could be argued that the skin is our immune sweet spot that the needle misses altogether. And that's a key attribute of the, the patch that we're, we're pursuing in the lab. In the movie, we talk about the kick up the backside. Well, in the lab, uh, it's, it's happening uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis in, in chasing uh, a replacement uh, for the needle and syringe. To provide some context, uh, scale drawings, uh, engineers like to do that. And here's an example of uh, uh, a standard needle uh, compared to one of our nano patches. We do have devices uh, here that I'm happy to, to pass around uh, throughout uh, the proceedings in the evening. But uh, on that particular square, we have thousands of tiny little projections. And the backstory of this is my, my colleagues, uh, particularly when I was at Oxford, encouraged me to map the skin's immune system 
see where the cells are and find ways to target things to those cells. And that led uh, to inventing this particular approach. It's an ultra high density array of projections. You can't really see them with the invisible eye. And we apply that patch to the skin and it delivers vaccine directly to thousands of antigen presenting cells. And we indeed have data in the mouse model generating, uh, showing uh, improved immunogenicity. Now relax if, if you think I'm about to embark on a big immunological uh, data package. I won't do that tonight as much as I'd like to. What I will do though is show you just this, this one picture. It's colored, uh, but it's, it's real data. Uh, and what this shows is one of the projections of the nano patch being applied into the skin. And we have the viable epidermis just here in the dermis. And those cells that I've been talking about, those immune cells, are jammed within these, these particular uh, layers. And that's just something that the, the needle uh, putting vaccine into muscle just can't do. How does this connect to the developing world? Well, uh, we'll talk tonight about the, the barriers uh, for vaccination and um, the cost is, is one component on that. And if you can uh, reduce the cost by reducing the amount of vaccine you need, that's a key way of doing that. Now, our journey right now is uh, we've proven well and truly the nanopatch and the animal model. We've worked on all different sorts of diseases, including some that I'd never even heard of until not long ago. And, but now we're, we're, the spearhead is, is taking it forward to the clinic. Uh, and a key part of that is a company that we uh, have, it's called, called Vaxis. But another uh, key thing we want to do is get the vaccine to the people that need it the most, it could be argued, and that's the people that are uh, in, within the developing world. And uh, a key part of the work that uh, has been funded by the Rolex project has been to catalyze that work and bring it forward. So I, I think you've got a little bit of an overview now, and I'm happy to, to turn uh, the floor over to, to Jeff to, to steer uh, the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, so I'm Jeff Garrett. I now need to do my uh, Tony Jones look-alike uh, show and encourage people to uh, participate. There are three components of how we're going to run the next half an hour or so. One is uh, we've got some questions. Um, these guys think they're Dorothy Dixers. I've actually manipulated things so they won't be. Um, we've got a number of questions already, like Q&A on Monday nights, um, from the audience, and we'll ask uh, Fred Bloggs or June Smith to uh, give their question. And then we're going to have free for all, and I'm going to pick on people. Um, so if I don't get too much, I'm, people in the front row particularly are uh, at risk. Uh, and we'll see how we, uh, how we go. There's a, this is important. Um, there's a Chinese proverb I like that says, and I'm sure many of us know it, an evening across the table with a wise man is worth a month of study in books. Uh, we've got some very wise people, as you would have gathered from Peter's very uh, helpful introduction. So let's absorb that, that knowledge. Um, I'm going to start off then by uh, actually getting a bit personal to um, um, God's gift to women. I won't use the other one. Um, the, um, so, Professor, um, if you were asked the question, um, starting your professional career again, would you become an immunologist? And if so, why? Well, that's a fair question, and I dare say quite a difficult one to answer because you've got to decide what an immunologist actually does. But I, I, I study the body's defenses against infection. When I started in that area, it was a challenge, and most of the answers weren't known. Interestingly, during my lifetime, a large part of our understanding of how the body defends itself against infection has been defined properly, and now we understand quite a lot. But we still don't understand why some people respond well to infections and some people don't. We don't understand why some people get really sick with infections. So there's a lot to learn yet and yes I would go back and I would be, I'd be delighted to start all over again because I now have time to get into the lab and do my research and not come along and answer questions here this evening. <laughs> <laughs> we take our first question from uh, the audience and uh, I think Robert uh, this is going to be directed your way. Uh, it's Petrina Gilmore. Who's sitting over there? Have we got a wandering mic so that we can actually get this recorded? Just hang on, Petrina, for a second. I've got a geographic problem. Thank you. Here we go. So, Petrina. Uh, so, I wanted to ask why vaccines seem to be introduced into poor countries many years after the introduction into wealthy countries. Why is that, and how can we reverse the reach of vaccines? 
Uh, Robert, you've got some... Uh, very <laughs> well, to me, it's a desperate disappointment that we take so long to bring a, a very good and safe and effective vaccine from a place like Australia to somewhere a canoe ride away in Papua New Guinea. And why? Well, first of all, when people develop a vaccine, uh, 15 years of investment means billions of dollars expenditure. And in order to get the money back, they have to introduce it in a place where people will pay for it. So uh, a vaccine, um, the first blockbuster in the world in 1999, which sold a billion dollars worth of product in one year in one country, was a pneumococcal conjugate for preventing pneumonia and meningitis. And it's something I'm working on right now with HIV children in Tanzania. Um, and that vaccine came into the US in 99, and, and this year is when the first time it's been introduced to Tanzania. So that's almost 15 years again. So if the HPV vaccine, which was developed by Ian, uh, could be brought into action so much earlier, that would be superb. Now that's been pretty much a blockbuster too. Um, Australia first and US soon after, Europe and the rest of the world. And so we, we can see it now. Uh, Ian's been working in various uh, Pacific and Asian countries to see it uh, introduced, and that's fantastic. And to see other vaccines introduced through Mark's technology would be just superb, not having to have the cold chain, not having to have a, a, a medical professional give a vaccine, hugely reduces the cost of delivery. And so if that can be achieved through, through Mark's technology, uh, you know, the world will become immunization's oyster and we can change uh, people's lives. They'll have less children because they won't worry so much about them dying. Could we pick up this 15-year question and conundrum a little bit? We've heard that number. Many of us have worked with science and technology for a long period of time. Know that it does take a long time uh, to invent stuff and bring it through to the market. However, we're also aware that pandemics happen overnight, nature fighting back, uh, and existing vaccines don't work. So you've got 20 minutes. Um, so what thoughts do you have on how you, uh, you lot are going to get to grips with this challenge? We, we recognize that we, we want vaccines now free and perfect, uh, but per particularly perfect, we want them to be safe. And one of the reasons why it takes a long time to get a vaccine out there is because we want to make absolutely sure through appropriate clinical trials that the vaccine is as safe as we would like it to be. So that is a challenge if we then need a vaccine straight away. The classic example of a vaccine that we really want to have pretty quickly is the current flu vaccine. Whichever flu virus is going around at the moment, we want to make sure we've got a vaccine. We can't wait 15 years. By that time, we've moved on through 14 further strains of flu. So it's a bit of a waste of time. So we have to compromise a bit. And we've worked out a way, not us, but the world at large has worked out a way of making flu vaccines relatively quickly. But what we lose by doing that is the chance to be absolutely 100% certain that they're absolutely 100% safe. We take the slight extra risk because we know roughly how to make a flu vaccine that's safe by saying, OK, we really need it in three months' time. Let's do it that way. I think it would be nice if we could work our way past that problem and then get on to the much more significant 15-year problem of how do we make sure that when we've got a vaccine like that, we get it out there where it's really needed. That's much more challenging, as Robert has pointed out, because the companies that make these vaccines need to get the money back that they've invested over the 15 years to prove the vaccines are safe, and they charge high prices for the vaccine. But I would stress that most of the vaccine companies now recognize that dif what they call differential pricing is an appropriate way to go. And the reason that the papillomavirus vaccine is getting out into the developing world only five years after it was first introduced is because the companies charge us for the development costs and charge the developing world only what the vaccine costs to make big difference and therefore much more feasible to get it out there. Can we pick up on um, this safety and risk aspect? And there's a question from uh, Danielle Aldridge uh, addressing this issue. Where is Danielle? She's right at the back there. Very good question, Danielle. Over to you. Perhaps you stand up. I don't quite remember the question, but I'll... <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to read it to you? <laughs> Mark, you spoke about um, the powder coating that you put on 
the nano patches, and I'm just wondering, will there be greater safety with the powder coating than there is with current liquid vaccinations that are available? So it's a, a type of formulation uh, that we're working on with, with a nano patch, and uh, indeed it's, it's in a dry form. Uh, the approach that we've uh, applied is taking a vaccine in its existing form and adding one thing into the mixture, and it's a standard, it's called an excipient, and it's an approved excipient. And uh, so certainly in, in the mouse model, that's proven to be safe. Everything's pointing towards it being safe. Uh, but uh, we've all talked about this 15-year journey. In truth, if I knew it would take 15 years, you know, I'll take a deep breath before starting because I'm only nine years in and uh, that means there's six years to go and that's if it works perfectly. Uh, but the next step uh, in the journey for us with, with the nanopatch is proving it's safe first in clinical trials and that's set to commence uh, late this year. And uh, the expectation is strong that it will be that, uh, but that's, that's part of the, uh, the narrative of what we've been talking about. Uh, it needs to be safe and effective. Do uh, Robert or uh, Ian have any further comments on, on the safety risk area? Robert. I think it's just massively important uh, as we go forward that this is one of the major things we deal with. It's demanded by the public and we don't want anything else either. We don't want our patients, ourselves, our children, our families to be affected. In Australia in 2010, we had a really bad outcome with our own homegrown flu vaccine for children where one in 150 developed high fever and a, a febrile convulsion, a fit, an epileptic event uh, within hours of having that vaccine. That vaccine was withdrawn in April, uh, three years ago. It has not been reused. Perfectly safe in adults. I get it myself every year. But it's not appropriate for children, so we use uh, uh, overseas-developed uh, flu vaccines. And I advocate that we take a much more careful approach uh, now that we should be testing a thousand children at least uh, before we um, give vaccines over to, to general use. Uh, flu vaccines at the start of the season, right now, before the flu season. Which parents are going to put their, uh, which thousand parents are going to put their kids up to the uh, guinea pigs in your experiments? Professor? Well, we're not going to use the local product. We'll start the studies for the first two or three years with the overseas products that are already been used in millions uh, in whom we have uh, uh, trust. And when the local product change is the way they produce it, that they split it more appropriately, uh, then, then we'll use it. And that'll take at least two or three years. Okay. Let's um, have a question from our future. It's great to see some uh, from scholars uh, in the front row. Um, and perhaps they've got a, a question to um, provoke the panel. Who uh, pick one of your colleagues? Thank you. D do give us your name, if you would, and tell us where you're from. Uh, I'm Courtney. I'm the science ambassador at Cannon Hill Anglican College. Um, and I was just wondering um, the nano patch, it seems really small and convenient, but when it's actually applied to the skin, what happens then? Like, would there, how long would it have to stay on to have an effect? That sort of thing. That's an excellent <laughs> question, Courtney. Uh, so, it's the science that tells us how long uh, the patch needs to be on the skin. Uh, in the mouse model, uh, we've worked quite heavily with the mouse and we've explored that very question. Uh, and it points towards uh, our standard published uh, uh, time of application is two minutes. Uh, however, uh, we've published work pointing towards it could just be a few seconds. Now, if the science lets us, lets us do that in, in the human uh, case, then that would be a, a fantastic proposition. Uh, simply because uh, we, we've got this, this kind of applicator, you can imagine instead of relying on a patient to hold, have the, the, the patch on their arm for a number of minutes, uh, you want to take that compliance factor out of play if you can. Imagine if you could just apply, retract, and, and throw the whole assembly away. Uh, so we're exploring that quite heavily, uh, but the shorter the better uh, is uh, a simple way of answering that question. Did he answer your questions adequately? Good, thank you. Let's talk a little bit more about the future. And uh, Ian, you, you mentioned the future. Um, uh, you mentioned HIV AIDS, you mentioned malaria. You previously talked about uh, viruses that lead to, to cancers. If we're having this conversation in 10 years time, where will we be? And, and please, I want you to be realistic. Uh, I'm a metallurgist by origins um, and uh, 100 years ago, 40 years ago, we were working on nuclear materials and 
and fusion power was 40 years away. Uh, 40 years on, it's still 40 years away. <laughs> so um, where do you think we're going to be in 10 years in this whole area? Yeah. Uh, as I said earlier, I think that the challenge we, we face now is that the low-hanging fruit have been plucked in terms of vaccines. The, Gordon Ader, very famous uh, Australian virologist who passed away a couple of years ago, made the comment that if natural infection with an infectious agent doesn't protect you against the disease in the future, then vaccines are very unlikely to. And that certainly applies for malaria. It applies for HIV AIDS, where you can certainly be reinfected with the virus on a subsequent occasion. What that tells us is that the natural defenses that we make against the infections we don't have vaccines for at the moment are generally not enough to protect us. Even the papillomavirus vaccine, the natural infection, doesn't really protect you absolutely. You have to have the infection two or three times. But the, vi the vaccine, fortunately, does protect you the first time around. Uh, so I think that we have to be quite realistic. We would love to have a vaccine that would prevent kids dying of malaria in the developing world. It probably is possible, but it's not going to be done simply by the way that we make vaccines at the moment. We need to understand more about what will defect defend us against these infections. So I think over the next five to 10 years, the work that's being done at the moment is teaching us what sort of defenses we need to protect us against the vaccines we don't have, the viruses and parasites that we are infected with that we don't have vaccines for at the moment. And I think that that work will turn into prototype vaccines over the next 10 years and maybe into products over the next 20 to 30. There's no reason why we can't get these. We just need to understand better what we're trying to achieve. Good. I want to move, and Robert, maybe you'll um, um, speak to a question by Suzanne Elliott that's uh, talking about the community and some of the uh, scaremongering uh, anti-vaccine lobbyists that we have in our community. So if Suzanne, where is Suzanne? Right there at the back. So if you could... Uh, Stand up and give us your question, that would be great. Hi, um, at the moment the community has a, um, I suppose a um, promotional by uh, the media about being negativity towards vaccination. You, you hear that in various communities, how are we going to uh, promote more vaccination? I think the patch will get over the fear factor of the kids and the big sharp needles and things like that, but how do we still make the community still be pro-vaccination for multiple different vaccinations that are coming out here at the moment? Yeah, thanks for that question. That's, it's on people's minds, but I want to tell you something that's totally different to that. Everyone gets their children immunised. 97% of Australian mums and dads have their children immunised. 1.5% are conscientious objectors only. And the media likes to paint a story of this versus that and a balanced approach, and they're completely unbalanced. The truth of the matter is that there's a great level of trust uh, amongst the Australian public. There's some people who are uncertain, and they're the ones who are benefited by having a good chat with the nurse, with the GP, with another professional who explains to them uh, the research that's gone into vaccines, the, the millions who've had it already safely. And when people get that kind of reassurance, that 15 to 20 percent who are uncertain are happy to proceed. So vaccination is more popular than the Liberals, the Labor, <laughs> the Greens, and all the others combined, even the Independents, because there's about a, <laughs> at least a 4 percent donkey vote in Australia. So, uh, you know, most people aren't donkeys. They get their children vaccinated. Now, have I answered? Suzanne, come back. Uh, is that uh, addressing your, your issue here? Okay. Free choice. Yeah, free choice. We're going to open up um, in a moment. Um, so please have your, your questions ready. And uh, I uh, typically look for the smiley eyes who I pick on. So I've seen a few around the place, so be warned. Um, but um, the, uh, the question I'd like to take next is from uh, Maria Omega, uh, who, uh, where is a Maria? Perhaps you would stand up, Maria. Thank you, and give us your question. I think you're going to address this one to, to, to Mark. I have three questions. Uh, I can't... You can have one to start with. Okay. Uh, uh, my name is Maria Omega. I'm a student uh, 
finishing Doctor of Biotechnology program at UQ, and I want to ask about uh, uh, have you uh, compared the percentage of uh, success rate between the traditional vaccine and nano page or in the lab or uh, in the real life? So is, is the question, have we compared the, the nano patch against the needle? See, the efficacy rate or success rate uh, the success, of this? The success, uh, rate. success rate. Success rate. Conventional needles versus... Uh, between uh, nano patch and yeah. the traditional vaccine. Thank you. Uh, quite heavily in the, in the mouse model, uh, we, we've done, done this work. Uh, we've worked with different test cases of, of vaccines. Uh, so one example is, is Ian's uh, HPV vaccine. Uh, include, uh, in addition to that, it's, it's flu. And so when, when we do these experiments, uh, comparing uh, the nano patch against intramuscular injection, uh, which is the, the standard way vaccines are done, uh, we tend to just wait uh, for the immune response to be generated and compare the readouts uh, that, that we get. And so there's nested questions in there. Uh, so one is, uh, can we achieve the, the same uh, immune response as the needle does, but with only a fraction of the dose? So that, that's one uh, comparison. And another comparison uh, that we perform, which is for the same dose, can we get a far better uh, immune response? And there's different flavors of immune responses, and I won't go into that uh, tonight. But um, as luck would have it, our lab has quite a, an immunological tilt to it now. And um, that's a key part of, of what we're doing, which is those assays uh, for, for comparison. Does, does Thank that you. answer your question? Yep, Maria, just hang on to your other two questions. We'll, we'll come back to you if we get a chance. So let's open it up for a moment or two. Um, there were some smiley eyes in the front row here. I don't know whether... Well, yes, here we go, sir. Um, let's just wait for the, uh, the microphone. It's on its way. And if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Hi. My name is Gunter Hartel. I work for CSL, a uh, statistician there. Um, I was wondering, with a nano patch, are there special regulatory challenges in getting it approved by health authorities? Very good question. Uh, so, obviously, uh, within Australia, we deal with the, the TGA. Uh, but in, in the US, uh, there's the FDA, and, and the, the two are reasonably aligned. Uh, we're, we're gaining a lot of advice on this. Uh, one, of the up, one of the upsides about doing something different is you can get a different result. One of the downsides from the FDA point of view is that it's different. So how, how do you look at that? And so there's even a little bit of debate of whether it goes through the vaccine route or the medical device route, and uh, believe it or not, the FDA has distinctly different departments uh, for both. Uh, probably with your, your background from CSL, you might not be surprised to hear that uh, the route that we're taking is the vaccine route. And uh, we're gearing up uh, towards uh, our interaction uh, with the, the FDA on, on that. Thank you. Thank you. you that don't get to grips with your question. Thank you. That's it. Here's one in the uh, row four near the front. Thank you. If you could introduce yourself, sir. Charles Jilks, um, new head of the School of Population Health here in UQ. Uh, very interesting, and I'm just wondering, as you move into safety and efficacy trials, which vaccines you're going to prioritize, and whether they're going to have a more Australian flavor or a more Papua New Guinea flavor? Because I don't think you can do all 10 or 15 vaccines that are available. I agree. Uh, there's so many candidate vaccines that are out there and so many existing vaccines that we believe we might be able to help uh, work be better. So we've taken the choice to be pragmatic. Uh, so we've begun uh, with existing vaccines with the idea of making them work better. And one, one of the rationales of that is, is it's the most streamlined route through the, the FDA, uh, for instance. Uh, so currently, uh, within the world of vaccines, that, that, that puts a stake in the ground on what's called conventional vaccines. And within the conventional vaccine realm, we've published quite heavily in uh, influenza. Uh, vaccines is, is one example, and another example is uh, human papillomavirus. So that's, that's, that's what we're focusing on uh, in the first instance. Uh, we've got enough cutting edges as it is before uh, adding uh, a, a candidate vaccine that's still yet to be tested or a new uh, thing that's put in the vaccine, which is called an adjuvant. Uh, in time, of course, we'd like to more broadly uh, roll out the nanopatch, but uh, we need to be quite focused. Building on that question a little, um, we'll continue to open a moment. I'd like to just pose to the panel, maybe Ian, you want to kick off um, around where we put our focus and our focus in the research domain. Here in Queensland, we do 0.18% of the world's R&D. So 99.8% of the world's R&D happens outside Queensland. So 
why are we spending money on the sort of stuff that you're doing when there's lots of other uh, people in the world working in the same areas and there's lots of other challenges in Queensland? Why would we do it here? <laughs> so I suppose, uh, start, let's start with the point, 0.18%. Uh, if we're, we're thin on the ground in that department, we better choose what we do and do it really well uh, yep. in, in the first instance. Uh, science is collaborative, it's also competitive. Uh, so we choose our collaborators, but we have our competitors uh, as, as well. Uh, so we, we're, we're always being benchmarked uh, against our competitors, uh, and we, we need to be doing something that's, uh, that we're good at. Uh, and, and do it really well, and ideally be doing it better than our competitors. And if we can prove that uh, on the world stage convincingly, then I think we've got a pretty good case uh, for going to the, the local uh, authorities, including the, the Queensland government. Good. Uh, so let me, for, for let me follow that uh, to the Australian of the Year and say, you get a letter tomorrow from uh, Bill Gates, very impressed with your work, Australian of the Year, Gardasil, all that sort of stuff, and here's a cheque for $100 million uh, to invest in research. Where would you put it? What would you put that money? <laughs> Apart from in your Apart own... Apart from in my back pocket, you mean, <laughs> yes. Uh, Where are the priorities that we should really be investing in? Look, uh, there are so many priorities, but the, the reality is that we all want to live not so much really long lives as really healthy lives. Uh, and uh, for the developing world, a healthy life means a life where you get good food and good water and protection against infectious diseases. So we have to continue to work on infectious diseases. Uh, for the developed world, the biggest problem we face, which shortens our life these days, is cancer. And 20% of cancer is caused by infections for which we don't have vaccines. And we should be working on those infections too. I'm an immunologist, I'm biased, let's face it. I want to work on things I understand. But I think we also want to work on things which are high priority for a large part of the population of the planet. And in the developing world, it has to be infection still. And in the developed world, cancer would be on the top of my list. Robert, if he handed the money over to you, where would you put it? Well, see, I'm a vaccinologist, I'm not an immunologist, but some people uh, in the media confuse the two. Uh, I, I recognise that in the uh, poorer countries there's now rising um, smoking levels, there's rising obesity, heart disease uh, as well. And so the, the, the decision is a complex and a difficult one. Um, I'm biased and so clearly I can see the imperative of preventing infection. In my own background, less than 100 years ago, my family in Holland lived in squalor. Uh, my mother's sister died of TB buried in the same casket as a six-month-old child dying of TB. We've conquered so much of that through advances in our standard of living, economically and so on. So infection will always be a priority for me. It's what I do, it's what I see as a clinician, and I want to prevent. But I also recognise that chronic diseases are on the increase, not only in rich countries, but obesity and so on are issues that will need to be addressed in the third world. So I'd get a committee together to decide. <laughs> <laughs> Good university response. Uh, we'll take a last couple of questions. One down the, uh, the front here. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ross Hanson. Um, I'm assuming that the nano patch in its current form delivers a single vaccine. I imagine with the, uh, with the multicellular contact that the nano patch does, there's potential there for multiple vaccines to be delivered in the future. Is that, is that true? I think that is a fair, a fair prospect. Uh, so although, for instance, we've been working with um, one vaccine, uh, as an example, uh, influenza, it turns out there's three strains within that. So there's, there's three vaccines within one. Uh, the same with the HPV vaccine. Uh, there's four strains with, within what's on the market right now. We're thinking about the pneumococcal vaccine, which has 13 uh, strains. But if we, we think about children uh, and trying to reduce the, the schedule uh, that the children uh, uh, that's set upon them, uh, that there's certainly a, a prospect of uh, combining uh, regimes there. Uh, but we've just not explored that just yet. Uh, well, we're going to take just two more questions. We're just getting the hands coming up, but I'm under strict instructions. 
Uh, Maxine Whitaker at the School of Population Health. A lot of my work is in trying to get all these technologies scaled up into programs in development settings. And just interested in your delivery device, are you going to try to make that disposable or used more than once? You mentioned before it's once, because although you're going to reduce the bulk of the vaccine vials, um, that's a lot to put in a helicopter to deliver to Southern Highlands and Papua New Guinea and will cost a lot of money. So some engineering on disposable yes. units, I suppose, is next on the, on the rank. There's a, a first order bifurcation in, in our work. Uh, so the developed world, it's uh, in the first instance a uh, reusable, sorry, single use disposable device. So you throw away the, the whole thing in, in one go. Uh, what we've done with uh, uh, the, the Rolex project is engineered a reusable device. So you keep, keep the applicator but you throw away just this component, uh, which, which is the patch. Uh, so at the moment, we have that bifurcation of, uh, of activities. Good. In, your, in Maxine's row? Yes. Thank you. Diane Matthews, ERA Consulting. Um, looking at things from the regulatory affairs side, which is where I tend to operate, is to say that, and we're speaking to the timelines that you've alluded to and the great delays, even the delay in the first approval, let alone getting it out to the other re geographical regions, what we also need as part of this picture is regulatory science ways in which to try to, if we can, squeeze in the, even the regulatory part of this and look at in vitro modelling and any other tools that we can come up with in the pharmaceutical sciences uh, to, to try to abbreviate the first approvals and then apply that even more cleverly to iterative like influenza, et cetera, other, other ones where the model will be firm and we're just looking at now which particular strain, is it immunogenic really or not? Do you need an adjuvant? What is the risk of that? So there's a, there's a lot of things to be done also on the, the, the processing side as much as all the wonderful technology and, and picking the targets. Uh, agreed. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm really glad the FDA finally did figure out it was a, a vaccine. I, we, we as can well see as a if, if, there, if there's a way to streamline the regulatory process in, in a safe way, we're entirely up for that. Uh, from where I sit uh, as, as a, an engineer and um, a researcher, I'm not in that part of the food chain. Uh, my, my part of the food chain is, is working within their framework and trying to make it happen. Uh, but certainly, uh, if, if the, the regulatory authorities uh, improve their, their assays and, and help streamline that process, that's fantastic. We just, we just we'd never get a grant to do that. Uh, and we'd never get venture capital funding to do that either. Uh, so I'm afraid that's just where we sit in the food chain. Thank you. Good the government. We're going to take our last question from one of our youngsters at the, the front here. If we could have the microphone. There we go. Just here. So give us your, your name, young um, man. Hello. Yep. I'm Chris Hart, the Science Ambassador for Emmanuel College. Um, my question's for Mark. I was just wondering uh, what time frame this project is thinking to be released onto the general public, you know, when you reckon you'll be finished by? or what stage you're currently at? Thank you. Okay, excellent question. Um, yeah. I wish I had the crystal ball uh, here, in, here in front of me. Uh, it takes a lot longer than you'd think, uh, than, than I'd, I'd even imagined. Uh, so we've, heard, we've talked a few times about the 15-year narrative, and that's when it works. So what, what Ian's done with, with Gardasil, it's remarkable and it's amazing. And it took 15 years for, for his journey with, with others that, that, that became a part of it. And that's when everything worked really well. That's a best case scenario. Spare a thought for the people that, that there's an attrition. Uh, a lot more, more things don't work than, than do. Uh, we're, we're about nine years into the, the ride uh, right now. Uh, so if I imagine uh, that just for a moment, if I have a fit of optimism that, that it's, it's going to happen, and you've got to believe it's going to happen, uh, then quite possibly it might be another six years. Uh, so just don't hold me to it. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Appreciate that question. Um, great SS uh, Samuel Johnson once said, knowledge is of two kinds. We either know a subject ourselves or we know where to find information on it. We obviously know who to consult, but I would recommend you, uh, those of you who haven't seen it, a fairly recent publication by the Australian Academy of, uh, of Science. Uh, and Ian was on uh, the panel. It's a really well-written piece of work on the science of immunization, immunization questions and answers. Uh, so it's on the uh, Academy of Sciences uh, website, it's easy to find, easy to download, and I think it's well written. 
uh, and you're on the panel, you should be congratulated for that. I'm going to finish off before I reintroduce Peter just by giving each of the panelists 60 seconds to respond to two questions. One, what are you excited about in the business you're in? And two, what keeps you awake at night? Worrying. Let's start off with, uh, with Mark and then Ian <laughs> and then. <laughs> uh, getting, things, getting things done of substance uh, excites me. And um, getting things done of substance uh, excites me. And working with really good people uh, excites me. Uh, feeling that you've done more at the end of, you wake up the, at the end of day of work that you've done something compared to the start, uh, that, that excites me. What keeps me up at night, jet lag uh, is, is one, uh, but uh, beyond that, um, I have a notepad uh, next, to, next to my bed and sometimes I just wake up in the, in the middle of the night with ideas and just write it down. Uh, so ideas sometimes and worry. Yeah. Robert and then Ian. <coughs> what are you excited about? What do you worry about in the business you're in for the world or for your, your group or wherever? Hmm. I, I, I'm excited about change. Um, the only constant we have is change. And how can we be a part of that? How can I be a part of that? Uh, how can I be involved in things that matter um, on, on, on every level? So that's a very general answer that squirms out of a direct answer. What keeps me awake? is uh, a, a, a fear of failure, of really wanting to spend more time playing with ideas and then writing up the research that's been done, really grappling with things that I've been thinking about for a long time and I don't get them down on paper and that applies also to um, making the persuasive case to funding bodies, whoever they may be, to give um, <clears throat> uh, funding financial support to do um, better research. Thank you. Professor Fraser. Well, what really excites me is the prospect that we've got new viruses, new infections to find that cause diseases that we already know about. I'm looking for viruses that promote skin cancer at the moment, and I would be really excited if we found one because it would mean that we would have something we could do to help reduce the burden of that disease. And it's great fun finding something new. Uh, what do I worry about? I worry about whether we're providing enough encouragement to the next generation to get involved in medical research. We starve them of funds, we cut funds to the universities, a bit topical at the moment, uh, but we also provide a career structure which would put most people off the job altogether, and I really think we need to address that seriously. We are a knowledge-based economy. They keep telling us that, but then they keep doing things which show that they don't really believe it and want to dig more coal out of the ground. I have no problem with digging coal out of the ground, but I would like to see some of the profit that comes from that invested in what we are trying to be, a knowledge-based economy, because that is good for Australia, and it benefits everybody. Thank you. I'm now going to, I think, well, applause was happening. Now we can give them a <laughs> I'm now going to hand you back to, to Peter to, to finish off. Uh, one of the pleasures, I'm still a fairly new Queenslander, and uh, on my journey around the state, um, I always say to myself, wow, I didn't know we were doing that stuff. And wow, that's fantastic. And one of the things that we've got, and Peter can be very proud of the institute and the people that he's built over the last few years and the talent that's been assembled here, and it all goes very well to the future. So this type of event, bragging rightly so about the sort of things that are happening, well done again, Peter, and you to finish off. Well, a very brief sort of summing up, and I think you've, you've really heard wonderfully from the panel that science is truly international. It involves many people and many skills, and there's some exciting work going on here in Queensland. I mean, Jeff asked the question, why 0.18 should we do anything? I think the answer is, we all know, Australia's got a productivity problem. We've got a two-tier economy. We have to do something, and it has to be led by knowledge-based industries. And we've heard some wonderful examples of that tonight. I mean, a lot of people don't know, if we look at CSL, an Australian company, it's now supplying one third of OECD countries serum products, a third of the world's free world serum products out of Australian technology going global. Fantastic story. Cochlear, ResMed, and even Australia and the vaccine stories you heard. We've done extremely well, and we want to see uh, that continue in doing better. You might have seen the ads saying we're exporting $4 billion worth of pharmaceuticals, which is more than the car industry and more than the wine industry. So, there's an opportunity, and I think you've sort of got a bit of a, a glimmer in the fact we've got the researchers here saying there are many more challenges ahead in the 
pedaling very hard is, is wonderful, I think, for uh, humanity and for Australia. So I'll sum up there. Um, I've got to thank a number of people, obviously Petrina Gilmore and Amanda Briggs and Prue Rayner for helping put together tonight, which as usual is run in a seamless fashion, so thank you to all of you for the contribution you've done. I think we should greet it with acclamation. The other thing you might have noted that in, in Mark's slides, and it was limited to four, there were some fantastic images of things projecting the cells, of imaging where the antigen, the protein's going. And I'd be pretty sure that in the room somewhere are some of the, the students, the workers who've done that. And I think we should acknowledge those wonderful images they do that make it easier to, to, uh, to conceptualise. And finally, we've got to introduce our facilitator. Jeff, thank you very much for doing that and Robert, Ian and Mark for really a fantastic presentation. They're obviously going to be a very productive uh, in the future and I think tonight coming along and presenting some of that excitement to us has really been very enjoyable. So please thank the presenters and the panel. Thank you.